Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. And here's Glenn Merzer, my dear friend and author and screenwriter. Uh, uh, he's, he has this tremendous capacity for telling stories. And his latest book and his latest story is that America goes vegan. Take it away, Glenn. Thank you, Silas. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I, I will get to talking about my new book with Tracy Childs, America Goes Vegan. Um, I'll say, though, that uh, what happened was that I've been writing and co-authoring books for many years, um, trying to make the case for the healthy, whole foods, low-fat, vegan diet. Uh, and then when I met Silish a couple of years ago now, I learned that we need to get the planet vegan by the year 2026. So that was much sooner than I expected and it put a lot of pressure on me and I developed a hernia. <laughs> so uh, I had to take some time off in January for hernia surgery, but now I'm back and uh, Tracy and I uh, put out this book, America Goes Vegan and the, the the idea is that if we can just get everyone to get the book, read the book, give the book to somebody who isn't vegan, and they all read the book and keep that process going, then America will go vegan. And then after America goes vegan, then the world will go vegan. And after the world goes vegan, the climate will finally begin to cool. And then after that happens, I'm suggesting we have a concert in Central Park to celebrate starring Paul McCartney. So that's the plan. You can't get your concert tickets yet because there is work to do first. OK, but that's the plan. Um, uh, I'm delighted uh, to follow uh, Lisa's lovely uh, interfaith meditation because, in a sense, faith is what I want to talk to you about. And and um, I grew up in a secular household, and faith isn't usually a subject I speak on. Uh, but I'm reminded of the play that became a movie, Inherit the Wind. Uh, many of you probably saw that. For those who didn't, I'll sum it up briefly. Um, there was a teacher, and this is based on the Scopes Monkey Trial of the 1920s, I think. There was a teacher uh, teaching evolution, and he gets prosecuted for teaching evolution. Now, as a child seeing that movie, I thought, boy, those were the bad old days when a teacher could get prosecuted for teaching science, for teaching evolution. Today in Florida, you could lose your job for teaching that racism exists. And now they apparently want you to teach that there was an upside to slavery. So, you know, the bad old times are back, or at least are threatening to come back. Um, but really, what that in that in that play that became a movie, uh, what happens is that the defense counsel, played by Spencer Tracy, defending the teacher who taught evolution, puts the preacher on the witness stand and says, "The earth was created in how long?" And I guess in the Bible it says six days, something like that. And he says, well, how long is a day? How long was a day back in, in those days? 24 hours? Really? Was it all? Could it have been back at the time that the earth was created? Could it have been 25 hours? And the preacher makes the mistake of conceding that. Yeah, I guess back then it could have been 25 hours. Really? Could it have been two days to 48 hours? Could it have been a billion years? And by by introducing the concept of flexibility within faith, the, the movie leads to the point that faith and science can be reconciled, but only if there's some flexibility within faith. 
only if you uh, accept that science really exists and we have to interpret things around that. Um, and I say that because uh, uh, I really believe that the battle today for a sane world and for a livable world is, is the struggle that was dramatized in Inherit the Wind. It's, it's the struggle of culture versus science. And, you know, my life's work is, is taking the, the side of science, and I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm a writer. I was a playwright originally. But this is the, the struggle for the world, is we need to defend science. Um, I want to uh, give a shout out to, to a new friend, to new friends of mine who I never met before who are in the audience, and, um, and Bram and Beneke, hello, and, and uh, Bram is a meteorologist, and he is on the side of science, joined our cause to, to promote a, a um, a sane, uh, a sane approach to nutrition and to the climate. Um, uh, and I happen to know that Bram and Benecki, because they mentioned this in the email, are uh, members of the uh, Unitarian faith, which is the most, I think, flexible <laughs> religious faith that I know of. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a, a, a Unitarian communion service, but the Unitarians take a bite of a wafer, wafer and a sip of wine, which they believe represents the body and blood of Pete Seeger. So it's a wonderfully flexible faith. And that's what we need is a flexible faith so that we could approach the problems that face humanity without denying science. So let me say why I think that science denial is what is our enemy here, the enemy of humanity. Um, there is science denial in the field of nutrition. All the science, all the science supports the diet that we advocate. It's not some of the science, it's not half of the science, it's not 90% of the science, it's all the science. All the science uh, confirms that human beings are herbivores. And I will give you just a few examples. I have written books on this. And please pick up a copy of America Goes Vegan, you'll see some of the arguments in there. But Let's start with an experiment done in 1913 by a Russian fellow named Nikolai Nikolaya, Nikolaevich Anichkov. In 1913, he did an experiment on rabbits. Now, we don't approve of that. We don't approve of animal experimentation, but this was 1913, so let's let it go. He, he fed egg yolks to some poor, unsuspecting rabbits. And you know what happened? They all developed atherosclerosis. Now, why did that happen? Because rabbits are herbivores. And when you feed cholesterol to herbivores, and this has subsequently been confirmed in other experiments with other herbivores, when you feed cholesterol to herbivores, they always get atherosclerosis. Now, when you feed cholesterol to omnivores, like the dog, they don't get atherosclerosis. Never happens. When you feed cholesterol to carnivores, like the cat, they don't get atherosclerosis, never happens. So what we're talking about is 100% of the time, when you feed cholesterol to herb herbivores, they get atherosclerosis, and 100% of the time, 
When you feed it to omnivores and carnivores, you don't. Now, human beings, as we all know, get atherosclerosis. In fact, they have discovered through autopsies that even children in America have the beginnings of atherosclerosis. So let's do the math. And I don't think this math is very difficult. Only herbivores get atherosclerosis. Humans get atherosclerosis. Ergo, humans are herbivores. And in fact, there is no other animal on earth that gets atherosclerosis because the omnivores and the carnivores can't. And the other herbivores are smarter than we are. They eat their own food, plants. So to make the case for as so many books out there do that human, you know, the paleo books, the caveman books, the uh, Atkins books, whatever all these crazy books are that advocate eating meat, they're denying the fundamental obvious fact that, that I've just proven with elementary science. Now there's more, there's evolution, going back to inherit the wind. We are the cousins of the great apes. Unless you are an evolution denier and a science denier, that's a rather self-evident fact. And their diet is 96 to 99% plants. They eat the occasional turbite. My attitude is, if that's what you wanna do, go knock yourself out. But they are plant eaters. Um, and, uh, and then there's blood pressure. Blood pressure is dispositive. The diet that gives you the healthier blood pressure is the human diet. Can't be denied. Nobody, but nobody makes the case for high blood pressure. And there have been countless, countless experiments done, studies done that have proven that the plant-based diet gives you health, healthfully low blood pressure, reduces your blood pressure. And we know why. And again, it goes back to saturated fat and cholesterol, narrowing the arteries when you eat meat and when you eat animal foods. So there are just three examples, and I could go on and on and on with all the evidence that humans are herbivores. So we have this battle against science denial. And that's what they are. They are like, you know, the preacher in the Scopes monkey trial and in inherit the wind. The, those who are making the case for an animal-based diet or for any animals in the diet are simply nutritional science deniers. But it's not only nutrition, it's also the climate. Silish has done the groundbreaking paper uh, demonstrating that uh, the leading cause of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is animal agriculture. And even a non-scientist like me was able to read his work and see the evidence and see how obvious it is. It is obvious that when you're factoring in the causes of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you have to include carbon opportunity costs. You have to include what would happen if that which exists, animal agriculture, did not exist. What if animal agriculture didn't exist? What is the carbon opportunity cost? Well, that's over 40% of the earth that's being grazed and another few percent of the earth being used to grow grain to feed to animals. Totally 43% of the non-ice land surface of the earth. Well, if we didn't foolishly as science deniers eat animals, that 43% of the earth can be rewilded. It won't all return to forest, but it will, that which doesn't return to forest will be more heavily vegetated. 
and the amount of carbon dioxide that would be sequestered thereby would cool the planet, effectively ending the climate crisis. And it's obviously, obviously the only way to end the climate crisis. Just think of the foolishness of concentrating on nothing but, but energy generation, nothing but the burning of fossil fuels. We've been doing that for 30 years. How well is it working? It's a fantasy. Because even if tomorrow we had solar airplanes, and even if tomorrow all the cars were electric and all the electrici electricity was generated by clean energy, all good things. I'm in favor of, I'm in favor of that fantasy. But even if tomorrow we stop burning fossil fuels, the climate will keep heating because there's still 1.5 billion cows out there belching methane. Methane, to account for it honestly, is at least 120 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. And when there's a molecule of methane in the atmosphere, it doesn't care whether it came from a gas pipeline or enteric fermentation inside a cow. It's the same molecule. So we need to view those 1.5 billion cows out there from a climate perspective as being the same thing as gas pipelines emitting methane into the atmosphere. It's just too much methane. And methane is the gas that more than any other is leading to the incremental heating of the atmosphere right now. And methane is the signature gas of animal agriculture. That along with nitrous oxide, which is 300 times as potent a greenhouse gas as, um, as carbon dioxide. And we are fouling our land with lagoons of manure from cows and pigs, and these lagoons are emitting nitrous oxide and methane, these terribly powerful greenhouse gases. And so when I talked about science deniers before, most of us, in the, when we think of climate, we think of climate deniers as people who don't believe uh, that there's anthropogenic climate change, that humans are heating the planet. There are less, fewer and fewer such people today because we've seen that we see the storms, we, the heat wave in Phoenix now is a, a 31 days of temperatures of around 110 or more. I mean, uh, we, we see the heat domes, we see the tornadoes, we see the floods, uh, and the, just the temperature of the earth breaking records. So we need to include, when we talk about climate deniers, we need to include not just, you know, the people like Senator Rubio of Florida who say things like the climate is always changing <laughs> and try to deny the reality that it's getting hotter. Um, we need to also include Al Gore. It's time we include Al Gore as a climate denier. It's time that we include all those who insist that the only cause of climate change is the burning of fossil fuel. The burning of fossil fuels is the second leading cause of climate change. And it is, in my opinion, a fairly distant second. We need to recognize that the leading cause of climate change is animal agriculture. So in the book, America Goes Vegan, I try to take us on a little journey within each chapter and talk about climate and nutrition from a distinctly American perspective. I try to make the case that the patriotic thing to do is to be a vegan. 
because we are fouling our land with animal agriculture. We are fouling our waters with animal agriculture. We are fouling our air with animal agriculture. And we are making ourselves sick. And, uh, you know, we are the single, now think about this, because this is really remarkable. There, there have been human beings for, uh, you know, modern human beings for something like 50,000 years and, uh, and some form of hominids for millions of years. And um, in all of human civilization, we are today the fattest, sickest population ever to walk planet Earth. 42% obesity in America. So the patriotic thing is to get us healthier. And the only way to get healthier is to not be a science denier, eat the diet that has been proven, that is easily proven to be the natural human diet, eat plants and mushrooms. Um, so, so that's the case I try to make in America Goes Vegan. And I try to also make the case that this isn't difficult. These these changes are easy to do, and you could take the same foods that people are used to eating, mac and cheese, and Tracy Childs provides 120 recipes to show how to make the most basic, well-loved, um, you know, traditional American foods and make them healthy and vegan. So we don't have to give up our culture, just like you don't have to give up your religion to believe in evolution. We don't have to give up our culture to, to adopt a healthy human diet. We just have to transform our culture a little bit. We have to be a little bit flexible with our culture. Like you have to be a little bit flexible with faith. And if you just uh, incorporate that attitude of flexibility, you can keep the traditions you grew up with, the faith you grew up with, and deal with scientific reality. So with that, I will turn things over to Tracy Charles, the culinary wizard who came up with all the recipes for the book. Unmuting myself here, there I go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Glenn and, and Salish and everyone who's organizing this event. Um, and I really appreciated your, um, Lisa, your beginning to this event. Um, it was so nice for me so early in the morning to, to be on uh, here in California. So um, uh, yeah, when, when Glenn approached me about this uh, topic and about this book, I was just like, I love the title um, because listen, I'm an American. I, I'm actually um, distantly related to every US president. So I just found that out. <laughs> and so almost every US president, except the ones that um, don't have English names or whatever. But um, anyway, I, um, you know, I raised a family vegan, um, and I've been vegan since 1990, and it's just been my passion to um, to learn about the cooking and to um, contribute any way I could. So I've been a community organizer here in San Diego. I, I have an organization called Plant Diego, which is a plant pure pod, uh, part of the Plant Pure organization. But now we're part of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So um, part of a bigger organization, we're going to expand that. So just everybody look into that if you're interested in starting one of these uh, grassroots organizations in your own community. Um, but just a little, I uh, wanted to introduce myself a little and, and talk about my particular journey um, towards this type of lifestyle. Um, when I was 17 um, in my biology class, junior in high school, my teacher showed a cross section of pork and he on up on the screen and he started with the pointer looking 
and naming all the different microorganisms in there and um, saying, well, you know, this is this is one that could kill you and that one could kill you. Oh, that's not so bad. But don't worry, because we cook it. And so it's it's fine. It, they're all dead and they're not going to they're not going to harm you. Um, well, I took that as and I'm not I'm surprised that not everybody in the class took this as a warning and a and a sign that we shouldn't be eating meat. So just just for the case of, you know, well, do we want to eat dead microorganisms that were in pork? Um, and, you know, I just recently heard about sushi, um, that it is frozen to kill the parasites that are in the fish. So there's all this human error that could happen. I see, I see it. That's how way I see it. I, I want to have control and I want to, um, you know, just keep my food as clean as possible. Even at the age of 17, I kind of clued in on that. So, so I became the only vegetarian that I knew this is way back. <laughs> and, um, and then just went on with my life. Um, you know, all my friends weren't vegetarian. You know, I, my family was like, okay, fine, do what, you know, luckily you learn, you know how to cook. So, and my mom was fine. You know, she would make things vegetarian for me. And we, you know, honestly, we didn't eat a lot of meat. So um, we always ate a lot of vegetables. So I was that strange kid that liked vegetables. So it really wasn't a huge jump for me, but, um, but still, I was, you know, used to eating certain types of meat, especially, you know, honestly, the processed ones, because they were the least like meat. So I would eat those. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm not gonna eat those anymore. All the really salty stuff. That's the stuff I liked. But except bacon, I hated that because it actually resembled the animal. So, um, so I went on to college and was the only vegetarian in Idaho. I went to University of Idaho. Um, so I just became used to just being the odd person um, who didn't eat meat. But I always loved the lifestyle and I always was um, enamored with learning uh, more about it. Got all the books, um, read John Robbins, read all um, Diet, Diet for New America, Diet for a Small Planet. Um, I, you know, just wanted to learn more and more about it. And I wanted to find other people who were adopting this lifestyle too. So, um, so over the years, I learned more about animal agriculture. And, um, you know, back then, I, of course, I ate a lot of cheese, I ate a lot of eggs. Um, so I started to, just like a lot of people do, I started to get choosy about those things. I would, um, I would get the organic milk, um, although I never actually liked milk, but we use it in cooking and stuff like that. Um, I'd get the cage free eggs. Um, but then I was curious. So um, I read about those industries and this was back in 1990 and learned that, um, yeah, there's no such thing as cruelty free animal products. So, um, so from then on, um, I just became vegan. So I was over uh, of childbearing age, though, um, my my son was born in 1990, my daughter in 95. So um, I was very concerned about the nutrition end of it. And actually, um, it, it's funny because I actually thought um, I, I gave up dairy kind of after I was done nursing my son um, because I thought, oh, I don't want to deprive him of something. You know, I didn't want to experiment on him. Back then, you know, there was nobody breastfeeding or pregnant that I knew of that was um, that was uh, vegan. But um, I did follow Dr. Michael Clapper, and he had a great book. You know, I wish I should have grabbed it. It's um, it's pregnancy and the vegan diet and child and 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 all about raising kids and about um, it was just a real groundbreaking book and it was really kind of my bible I you know read I there was a few recipes in there that I made many many times and um, then I got to meet him so I also followed him he was great so um, now I just really encourage people to find those gurus like Dr. Salish Rao too, um, and follow them and just learn from them and just be inspired. Um, Cause that's really what does it for a lot of people. Um, I think seeing documentaries can actually, you know, really help people too, is um, just a couple hours spent watching a documentary can just change your life. I've seen so many people who've watched Forks Over Knives <clears throat> and, um, 
and just like change their lifestyle right after that. And then they start following forks over knives um, for great recipes and things like that. And so, so that's been my journey is just following the gurus and learning and, um, and of course, just wanting to contribute um, and figuring out ways I could do that. And so for me, since I'm kind of a foodie, I love food. Um, I and love getting in the kitchen, and experimenting and taking um, ideas and making them my own. Um, so that's how I <clears throat> became um, a contributor to this movement. Um, I uh, became certified with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine back in 2005 to become a Food for Life instructor. Um, and that was, um, I was one of the first who uh, was one of the, I was one of the first instructors. I went, flew to Washington, D.C., which is where they're um, headquartered and um, was trained and then went back to my community and they encouraged us to reach out to hospitals and reach out to healthcare organizations to teach how foods fight cancer. And so I, I did that. You know, I, um, I was at Sharp Hospital here in San Diego teaching for many years um, with Scripps, um, all, all the, you know, the big healthcare organizations here in San Diego. And so that's another um, idea. If you guys um, don't know about the Physicians Committee and you want to reach out and, and you love to cook and you want to reach out in your community, that's a good way you can get trained. So just go and, and search there for the Food for Life program. And they have online training now, so anybody can do it <laughs> from anywhere. Um, and so they've been such a big part of my life. Um, when I um, started teaching the classes, um, all the recipes called for a lot, not all of them, but when we sauteed, we would use olive oil. And um, then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, we came up with a whole new book and it was oil free for cancer prevention and survival. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. So I started, you know, learning the technique of actually sauteing without oil um, and just moved it into my own life. So I did a course in classes. But then it became automatic because I found out that the food tastes so much better when you do that. It's you taste the food more because what does oil do? It just coats the food um, and it makes it so you're, you know, you, you're not really tasting everything. And it makes you actually add more salt to get more flavor into your food. So it's very interesting that um you know, I really recommend, and, and, and listen, it, back in that day, when I started doing it, I was like, oh, what, that's really weird, um, and all your baked goods, also oil-free, you know, um, so I just learned all those techniques, and um, like, it, and then started taking recipes, making them my own, um, and so I was really excited to be part of this project to share, you know, a lot of these um, techniques I've learned, and um, these recipes, and also the fact that it was about comfort food was was really cool because I've always wanted to, or I, you know, I make every type of type of vegan food and everyday foods, but um, these comfort foods were um, I was really enamored with the idea because people need some foods that will that they're used to. I've, that's what I found over the years when I'm coaching and when I'm. Um, teaching classes to many, many people, um, they, you know, they, they're willing to try a lot of people in their cooking class. Of course, they're kind of adventurous anyway. So they're willing to try something that's new, but then other people really aren't. And so um, they really want to shift over from the standard American diet they're eating to a vegan standard American diet. I call it the VSAD. The standard American diet is the SAD diet and the VSAD is the vegan standard American diet. Well, we're making the, the vegan diet, but healthy. So that I needed an acronym for that. <laughs> so, um, so the vegan uh, standard American diet um, is, you know, still eating the French fries, still eating the donuts, still eating the versions of those foods um, you know, the cookies that are laden with, uh, vegan butter and which is like palm oil. Um, and just because they're vegan, but, um, like Glenn said, do we want to, you know, do that? Do we, you know, do, are you expecting to get any kind of health transformation 
or even transformation of the planet, if you're still eating these foods that are overly processed um, <clears throat> and unhealthy and artery clogging, um, I'm saying no. And, and I also like to add, um, I, I did a blog on um, Earth Day about that because uh, a lot of people say, okay, I'm gonna just go vegan and I'm going to um, help the planet that way. Well, what about thinking about the ingredients that are in those vegan foods? Think about um, the processing that went into it. Think about the packaging that went into it. Um, you know, that's another level, I guess. One level is just switching over. And the next level might be um, just examining what's in the food. Okay, it's vegan, just hand it to you, it's vegan. Well, what about, you know, like Beyond Burgers, for instance. Um, it's a great shift for people. I love that that they're available for um, those who you know can choose to eat that instead of meat. I'm really grateful that they're available, but um, I'd say a good transition. And then I want people as they become more and more vegan to get a little more mindful and um, consider the fact that it's nutritionally the same as meat, right? Except for it doesn't have cholesterol. But other than that, it's got a lot of saturated fat and it's really this, all it is is fat and protein. So if you talk about our burgers in our book, um, we've got like tons of recipes. And I also, um, my food company, I sell um, unprocessed, uh, wonderful burgers that you can just pop in your toaster oven. And that's what we do in the book. If you, if you make your own burgers, you can just make a whole bunch of them and um, keep them frozen and then just pop them in the toaster oven, the oven, or just heat them up somehow. And you've got a wonderful meal. And it's a, it's a food that has um, a lot more that, you know, nutrition in it because it's got all the vegetables. It's got whole grains. It's got, um, you know, all these seasonings. It doesn't, you know, we're not trying to make it taste like meat. You know, I don't think we really need to do that. I think the getting the, our taste away from meat is a good idea. Um, so since I've been eating this way for so long, I don't, I no longer have a taste for meat. And like I said, I really like it. So, um, you know, when the Boca burgers came out, did I like those? No. So, um, you know, it's, everybody's different. I understand that. Um, but when you change your taste buds and you take yourself away from those processed foods, your taste buds will change too. That's what people need to have faith about that. Um, and talking about faith is this faith in yourself, faith in, you know, yourself and, and also being good to yourself and valuing um, your food and valuing what you're feeding yourself. So um, I think also about processed foods is they're concentrated. Um, like for instance, the processed soy and things like that that are in Beyond Burgers or you know things like that, other you know foods like that. Um, it's it's concentrated. Who knows what you know? So I I always just say you know I want to have my food be not concentrated so that if there are some toxins or something like that in the food, at least I'm getting a smaller amount. If there are toxins in a food that's concentrated, you're getting you know you're loading yourself up with um, toxins. So, so that's again, you know, just things to think about. I, I like to, um, you know, just share things with people and get them to get more mindful about their food choices and about um, and why you might do that. And why are we eating low fat? That's another um, thing that people sometimes don't understand because obviously Americans eat a lot, a high fat diet normally. So when you talk about a low fat diet, which is what we're doing in the book, even though we're making all these comfort foods, it's a little higher in fat than maybe some other things because we did use nuts and seeds um, because we want to make things creamy and similar to what you've tasted. But you can still lower the fat by just looking at foods and looking at which ones are low in fat and which ones are higher in fat. And that's why I teach people in my classes. I say, well, nuts, seeds, avocados, those are all whole foods. They're great whole foods, but those are really super high fat foods. So if you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to uh, reduce your risk of coronary disease um, you might, and diabetes, you might, um, you know, just act, uh, accentuate the low fat foods, which is the potatoes and the um, grains and things and the vegetables and the fruit, all those really nice, you know, the four food groups. 
And then um, decentuate the ones and just not highlight the uh, higher fat foods. So, um, so anyways, I just love talking about healthy foods and uh, I think we're on to our next, uh, our next person. So thank you so much for, um, for having me here and um, everybody let's go vegan. America goes vegan. And could I just jump in? Sure. To say that um, there were two reasons why I approached Tracy to do the recipes for this book. First is the one you just heard. Tracy is concerned with making healthy and delicious uh, meals that are also uh, healthy and delicious meals. <laughs> I'm saying it wrong. Making delicious meals Oil that are great. also healthy. She's concerned yeah. with making foods healthy and low fat. So that was one reason. But the other reason Tracy doesn't even know. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, Tracy. The other thing is that I did an ancestry test of my own. And it turns out I am related to every vice president in American history. So between the two of us, we've got you covered. So that was the other reason. <laughs> there you Wonderful. go. We're Americans. <laughs> we do have time for one question. If someone from the from the audience wants to ask you, to. please raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Meanwhile, thank you so much for this contribution. Uh, you guys are amazing. I and mean, I saw all the recipes that you put together that are all comfort foods. But that's it. You know, you don't even miss the comfort foods when you go vegan and take care of your health. Go ahead. Tracy. I want to tell people to make the mayo. That's the best. It's the best uh, thing that if you're into, if you like mayo and we always, yeah. I always just used to keep vegan ace in the fridge. And now I keep my own mayo that I made. And um, that's a game changer for people because the nutritional um, balance of it is the opposite of what mayo is, which is super high in fat. I mean, obviously there's some fat in my mayo, but it's 1.5 grams per tablespoon as opposed to 14 grams of fat. So yeah. that's what I'll leave you guys with. And it's on my blog too. So you don't, you know, you can also find it on my blog, my mayo recipe, because I really need to share it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Any questions, BJ? I do not see any questions anywhere. Oh, I see Angela has a question. Go ahead, Angela. Hold on a second. She's muted. Hi there. How are you? So my question is, um, how how much um, shelf life does your food have? Like, you know, the, all those foods that you mentioned. So you're talking about the foods in the book or? Yeah, uh, like just in general, maybe like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like the dishes that you make because it's whole food, plant-based plant, plant uh, based food. So right. I'm assuming it might be, you know, like, I don't know, like not, not as long, right? Well, um, it's interesting that you asked that. That's a really great question. Um, so if you think about it, um, plant foods don't contain the bacteria to begin with that, um, that meat and dairy and eggs do, because those are coming from a dirty environment, right? They're coming from the animals. So at, when they enter your house, they are already pretty much um, going bad. They're going bad in the store. They have to keep them refrigerated, but they're going bad when you're entering your house. But um, the super processed foods, you know, like the cookies and things like that, well, those have been dried out. Those are really dry foods. So bacteria does not like them because nothing likes them. It's like, <laughs> there's no food value. So um, it's interesting, but high protein foods generally go bad faster than um, low, press, low protein foods. Um, so when you make the mayo, for instance, it's made out of tofu. So it is a high protein food, but what I do is I actually, here's my secret. I add probiotic powder to it, but I'm also adding, uh, apple cider vinegar, miso, um, 
and uh, what's the other? Dijon mustard. So those are the three ingredients I add to it and cashews. Um, so that those are preservatives. Isn't that cool? So, um, so anything acidic can be a preservative for a food. So there's a whole food science thing, but um, in general, you know, natural foods need to be refrigerated. So that's what I, I, uh, I, one of my products I do is my cookies here. And those are based with lentils and dates, um, tracysrealfoods.com. And we ship nationwide and they're um, semi-perishable which means because they're a moist cookie, they're high in protein, um, they need to be refrigerated. They can be out for a little while, for a couple of days. So every food's different, but um, they, but in general, I'd say um, be on the side of caution. Um, refrigerate almost everything you can. <laughs> you know, for instance, if you process flax seeds, refrigerate them. You don't need to be refrigerated necessarily if they're, um, unprocessed, but once you grind them up, refrigerate them. Anything you process, refrigerate. Anything you cook, refrigerate after it cools. So, um, but in general, most foods will start to break down after like, if it's a meal or something like that, or a salad or whatever, after like two, three days. So I'd say two, three days and then maybe toss it or compost if you can. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. And, and I get it all the time. And, you know, it's, uh, there's, I, I think the food scientists are, you know, kept busy, but there's really not, um, you have to like kind of experiment yourself <laughs> to, to learn. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both so much uh, for this very informative session. And uh, we have to move on to the next one. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.